What I'm going to be talking about is, is revascularization, but before I do that, I have to tell you a bit about pa the pathophysiology of coronary artery disease, because that's a really important part of our treatment uh, with revascularization. Key factors in coronary artery disease prognosis are threefold, but are very much uh, in that order of font size. I've put the bottom one deliberately in a lower font size because it's less important. The most important thing is the state of your left ventricle. If your pump function is good, generally speaking, your prognosis is good. If your pump function has been impaired by a previous myocardial infarction, you're going to do less well. The second important thing is what sort of coronary plaque you have. It isn't enough just to talk about the presence or absence of a stenosis in one of your coronary arteries. The prognostically important thing is whether that plaque is going to rupture and cause a heart attack. And as it's mandatory to have a magnetic resonance imaging slide in each of these talks, I just show you uh, a normally functioning heart and an abnormally functioning heart, someone that's had a really big anterior infarct here. This is going to shorten life. If your, if your pump function is good, your prognosis is good. So turning from the pump to the plaque, we know that what's important about the plaque is not how big it is, how much of the lumen it's uh, obstructing, but whether it's likely to fissure and cause uh, a, a, a clot to form within the artery. And these, obviously, none of these patients have done particularly well. But you can see the difference in a stable plaque at the top between a plaque that has ruptured and then healed over. But, and then this patient, who has actually got a clot nearly completely obstructing the lumen of the artery, this one, complete obstruction. So this will be unstable angina. This is ST segment elevation. And just... Uh, in vivo, if you put down a thing called an angioscope, uh, you can actually look and see. And this is, in life, a clot it's hanging out into the lumen of the coronary artery. And this is a patient with unstable angina. And why do plaques rupture? Well, it's because they're biologically different from plaques that don't. And the key factor is the cap. So this is a, the plaque that you don't want. It has a thin, inflamed roof over the atheromatous gruel inside it. The plaque that you do want has a thick cap protecting it from rupture and associated thrombus. So if you look at patients with stable angina, with thick, capped, maybe obstructive lesions, you can see that they do really well. They have a prognosis that is excellent, uh, out in the long term. In contrast, this is a deliberately antique slide. This is from back in the early 70s. And I put this up to show you what the state of an acute coronary syndrome is like if you don't have any real treatment, because this predates all the therapies that we now use. This, these were all people without evidence of left ventricular damage. They were men in their 50s and 60s. And you can see a really malignant uh, mortality, equivalent to uh, quite a nasty cancer, half of them dead at 10 years. So this is not a benign condition. Acute coronary syndromes, unstable plaques, are associated with significant mortality and morbidity. Stable angina, whereas it can cause bad symptoms, where it can limit activity, is associated with a good prognosis. And it's, it's not too... One could almost say that this is the difference between a benign tumour and a malignant tumour. So although they have the same underlying disease, they behave in different ways, and therefore we'd expect the effect of treatments to be radically different in them. So I'm first going to talk about revascularization in the bad ones, acute coronary syndrome and ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. And the first thing to say in the acute coronary syndrome patients is that they need quick, by which I mean hours to days, angiography and revascularization if they're in the higher risk groups. And this trial was one of the first to show it. 
Uh, it shows, uh, as you've heard already, the importance of absolute as opposed to relative risk. So thank God I put in absolute risk, otherwise Sandy would have been cross. This shows a 3% absolute decrease in risk, which is between patients who had an expectant management, in other words, angiography and revascularization only if they had further symptoms against a routine uh, angiography and revascularization. And that's revascularization with both PCI and with bypass surgery. So if you look uh, at a big meta-analysis published last year, you can see the same thing. This is across many thousands of patients and shows that if you have acute coronary syndrome, you need to have angiography and revascularization promptly, and that saves lives. And the extent of the amount of lives that it saves depends upon the risk group. So when you come in, we heard earlier about troponin. Well, troponin is one risk factor. There are now risk scores that you can use based upon the patient history, the ECG, and the enzymes to stratify people according to whether they're at low or high risk of other events. But in those patients at high risk, you can see a staggering 11% absolute reduction in risk. So that's a really important message that in acute coronary syndromes, revascularization with either PCI or bypass, according to the anatomy, is associated with saving lives. If you look at ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, this is a different uh, story because here you have minutes to hours to act rather than hours to days. And as you know, the preferred method of, uh, of treating these patients is now primary PCI. And that happens uh, in northeast London at the London Chest Hospital. And across London, there are eight heart attack centers where patients are brought directly by the ambulance to us. So this is a revolutionary way of treating heart attacks. London is the best place to have your heart attack probably in the world. And if you look at this, this is the evidence base for this. This is comparing angioplasty with thrombolysis. And you can see on all measures, it shows enhanced survival. So this is what happens. You get brought into the catheter lab. And just to show you what a normal coronary angiogram looks like, you can see up at the top uh, the left coronary artery, and here's the right coronary artery. So when you have an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, one of those is going to block. This is an anterior infarction, and these uh, are in, in time sequence. You can see the LAD here is blocked. The first thing we do is to put a wire down the LAD, and that relieves some of the obstruction and causes the blood to flow down. We then put a stent in the artery to open it up, and here is the end result. That process can take about 10 or 15 minutes and restores blood flow from zero to full. Same thing in the right coronary artery. Here we have it blocked off right at the top of the artery. The wire goes down, and you can see some improvement in the flow already. A stent is implanted. And finally, we get good flow down the artery, uh, and the normal appearance is restored. What we also do is to put a thin tube. It's called a thrombectomy catheter. It's actually just a, a small tube with a syringe on the end. And we can suck out clot from the artery. And this we do on virtually all cases. This is actually what you get out of the blocked artery. We've seen this before from Sandy, but it's again just to, to reinforce that our part of London is particularly afflict, afflicted with coronary artery disease with high SMR. These are the number of heart attacks that we get into the London chest each month. They're running at about 100 and 120 a month. And we have a government target to meet, which is a call, that's from when the patient picks up the phone, and calls the ambulance service to balloon, which is the first time we inflate the balloon in the artery, of 150 minutes, which is quite a short period of time if you consider the ambulance trip, occasionally patients being taken to another DGH en route. It's, it's a tough target. And we are achieving that now in about 80% of our patients, which is the government target is 75%. 
And our total mortality, interestingly, is exactly what Sandy said it should be. Uh, it's 2.8% for a myocardial infarction. This is an unselected group. So there are a lot of problems with coronary artery disease. There are a lot of morbidities and mortalities. But if you had stood up at a meeting 10 years ago and said that heart attack mortality was 3% in East London, people would have laughed you out of the room. So this is a very good result. And you can see that compared with uh, uh, other hospitals, peer data, we're doing extremely well. It's not just us, of course. PC, primary PCI is rolling out across the UK. And you can see that between 2003, when it was virtually not used at all, and last year, when it's used in about uh, just over half the number of patients treated with this in the UK. And it may not be a complete coincidence that over that period of time, the mortality for myocardial infarction in the UK has dropped from 12% down in this uh, overall group to about 8%. So we are making a difference. There are things you can do. It's not new technology, but it's new application of old technology, new ways of organizing healthcare that can make a real difference. So lastly, I'm going to deal with revascularization in stable angina. So the message to take away about the acute patients is that there is a definite prognostic benefit in these groups. We've heard from Adam earlier about the characteristics of angina, and this is just an illustration of, of the man carrying the bag, chest pain, after a meal in the cold. We're all familiar with that. And I won't go into this in any detail, but you're aware of the importance of prognostic treatment versus symptomatic treatment. And it's important when you're looking at a patient with coronary artery disease to have this in your head, to be thinking about what am I doing about prognosis and what am I doing about symptoms. And if the patient has no symptoms, you don't need to be thinking about the red box. So, are there any prognostic treatments in stable angina? This is a difficult question to answer. The conventional, treat, uh, conventional theory is that bypass surgery is recommended in the most severe group. In other words, those with left main stem stenosis or proximal three-vessel disease and impaired left ventricular function. And this is what we do. These patients, we do refer for bypass surgery even if they have no symptoms. Having said that, the evidence for this is very ancient, dating from the 70s. It predates everything uh, in terms of medical therapy that we've done and is never really going to be challenged because it would be unethical to randomize these patients now. So a small minority of patients with stable angina do get referred for prognostic therapy with bypass, but on fairly thin evidence. So usually, if a patient comes to angiography, that is, determines what sort, of uh, what sort of treatment they get. And these are patients who've failed medical therapy. Angiography tells us what to do. If there's minor disease, continue the medical therapy. Broadly speaking, if it's one or two vessel disease, you should have uh, PCI, angioplasty, uh, and if it's three-vessel disease, you should have a bypass. But over the last few years, the question is, do some patients with three-vessel disease, can we use angioplasty for those? It's also important to recognize that overwhelmingly, and this, this is in the USA, the vast majority of patients are treated by you rather than us with medical therapy. Courage trial is always asked about, so I thought I'd include it. This is about 3,000 patients with low-risk CAD. The most important thing to note is that 80% of them had no symptoms. So normally in British practice, we would not be thinking about revascularizing stable angina patients with no symptoms. There was quite a, a small proportion of the screened patients, and they all had good left ventricular function randomized optimal medical therapy or optical, optimal medical therapy plus PCI. And about a third of those that were randomized to no PCI needed it in the trial period. You can see that the main result was that there was no difference in mortality between the two groups. 
This was not unexpected because, as I've shown you, stable angina has a good prognosis, and we don't think that angioplasty does anything for prognosis. We do think that angioplasty is good for symptoms, and you can see that in the PCI group there was evidence of that with less angina, improved quality of life, and reduced need for revascularization. And that fits with every other trial that's ever been done in this area. So in terms of multi-vessel disease, that three-vessel disease group, every trial that's been done has shown the same thing, that there's no difference between PCI and bypass surgery in terms of hard endpoints of mortality. But there is a greater need for repeat procedures with angioplasty because of this phenomenon of restenosis. And restenosis is uh, when you get furring up of the artery again within the first six months. This is what you want. This is restenosis, where you take a, a narrowing, you make it look good with a stent, but six months later it's come back. And this is the target of drug-eluting stent therapy, which has dramatically reduced the risk of restenosis. So how do they stack up against bypass? And the information we have is from the Syntax trial, which randomized 2,000 patients with pretty complex, bad multivessel disease to either bypass or PCI. And the answer is the same. There is no difference in mortality between these two groups. There is a slight increase in stroke rate in bypass compared with PCI. And in terms of repeat procedures, there is still a need for more repeat procedures with PCI than with bypass. And you can see 11% of the PCI group needed another PCI compared with only 5% of the bypass group and very few needed a repeat cabbage. So the, the answer is uh, that in multivessel disease, both treatments allow equivalent mortality. There is a reduced risk of stroke with PCI, but that comes at a cost of an increased risk of, re, of a repeat procedure, predominantly with angioplasty. So my, just to conclude, the important distinction between acute coronary syndromes and stable angina. Acute coronary syndromes have a bad prognosis and there is evidence for a prognostic role for revascularization in both groups. In stable angina, there is no real hard evidence of a prognostic effect of revascularization and the two options, PCI or bypass surgery, are best determined by a collaborative approach but generally speaking, PCI for one or two and some low-risk three-vessel disease and bypass surgery for three-vessel disease. Thank you. <laughs>